Welcome back. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, just to remind us what our basic underlying premise is. <laughs> In Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, we have uh, a couple of verses from the parable of the sower. And it says, And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Worldliness is the sin of being attached to the world such that we neglect the kingdom of God. And being preoccupied with temporal matters to such an extent that spiritual matters are crowded out, I believe is what Jesus was talking about in those verses. I believe it is also why Paul probably wrote in Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 to set your minds on things above and not on things of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. If time permits, we'll spend a little bit more time on that, but I just wanted to at least state in the beginning of my final session that we need to be very, very careful about that. Also, in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, Jesus again gives us a parable. And I think there's an important lesson for us to keep in mind without wagging our finger in that particular case. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, You fool, this night your soul shall be required of me. I don't have any reason to think that man was not a admirable and maybe even a noble man. But he forgot that he didn't know what was coming tomorrow. And God had to call him a fool. Edward Luther once described worldliness as excluding God from our lives and therefore consciously or unconsciously accepting the values of man-controlled society. I don't think probably any of us here are in, would intentionally exclude God from our worldview. But I like what Luther said, it can be done consciously or unconsciously. When we have to make a geographical move, sometimes we exclude God from that process. And we just assume it will all work out even though there may not be a support system where we have to move. When we're, che- when we're choosing our mates, sometimes our hormones cause us to exclude God from those decisions. Sometimes our pocketbooks cause us to, maybe without thinking, exclude God from career decisions. And I think it all begins with our education. And our education begins in the home, and then it takes on a more formal process for most of us. That's where I want to begin now, somewhat where I left off yesterday, with the concept of our education. And it does begin in the home. Study to show yourself approved of God, a word when that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home like I did, you should be very, very thankful. Maybe you didn't listen as well as you should, but you were given quite a leg up. I have often thought, I cannot prove it because I have no control 
But I have often thought, had I not been raised in a Christian home, I would not be a Christian. Because I have a stubbornness within me that would make it very hard for me to change my worldview. Do I know that as a fact? No, I just have that as a strong suspicion. So I am thankful every day for that. Today we talk about education. And really I'll be talking mostly about the formal education, although the home is where education really occurs. And we're talking about the minds of our children. And that is where the real battleground is, isn't it? It's not in their bodies, it's in their minds. Most of you, most of us, were educated formally, either in the home, homeschooling, public schooling, and there may be a few here that had private schooling. I don't know. But I think there are dangers in all three of those, and there are opportunities in all three of those. Donna and I chose public schooling because of where we lived and we thought that would be best and I will have to say I am relatively pleased with the way that worked out. Some of you have chosen homeschooling and maybe some of you have chosen private schooling. If I lived in a different geographical area I might have made a different choice. If I was raising kids now rather than a few years ago I might make a different choice today. I don't condemn any of those. I think they all have pluses and they all have minuses and they all ultimately come back to what we as parents do in the home. But I want to talk a little bit about the concept of education as it relates to some of the issues that we've talked about. And I want to specifically talk about the impact of modernism, the use of reason, man's reason, to find answers. What effect does that have on education? The, the effect of postmodernism, and then finally a little, a few comments on the world view. Modernism is the issue of having our education or our thought process based upon technology and human reason, and that was the dominant mindset in America from probably the end of World War II up into maybe in the 1970s. Although these things all overlap were not exclusively one and exclusively the other. Some of you can remember with me the excitement of Sputnik going up, and some of you will have to Google to find out what Sputnik is. That's fine. But that was a great time of pride for America. Landing, setting foot on the moon, it gave us a national oomph, if you will. Was it worth it? Well, that can be debated. I don't know. But that was our mindset. Modernism, as it relates to education, takes the position that educators should be the source of knowledge. And its undergird concept is that when our children go to school or are taught, it is their teachers that are really the source of knowledge. And their teachers get their knowledge from human reason. Teachers, therefore, had a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of influence. And I don't know that that can be avoided. Teachers have that. But the concept or the underlying mind was that teachers and their textbooks would determine what truth was for the parent, or for the student, pardon me. And that truth was determined by technology and human reasoning. When we moved to the postmodern concept of education, things did change. And knowledge was then viewed through what's called the constructive lens. And if that term is new to you or unfamiliar to you, in postmodernism education, and none of us say, well, I'm going to send my kids to a postmodern school. It's just that underlying uh, environment that's there because that's the way the teachers have been taught. In a, in a constructive lens, it takes the position that the student has to construct what is knowledge and truth for themselves. Therefore, the teacher, rather than becoming the teacher of what is true, 
becomes the facilitator of helping the student determine what is true. And therefore, each student, each one of us, or each participant, has what they call a constructive lens. Therefore, knowledge isn't discovered, as a modernist would say, let's discover it through science, technology. So knowledge is not discovered in a postmodern environment. It is constructed or formed in the mind of the learners. Therefore, ideas taught are not objective reality, but they are human constructs. What is truth? Well, in a postmodern education, it is let us decide. Let us work on that. Let us figure out what truth is. Teachers, therefore, became more facilitators for the student to formulate knowledge and truth rather than simply the purveyors of knowledge and truth. Was that bad? Well, it wasn't good. Knowledge was therefore constructed by the students and by the teachers, and the underlying concept of postmodernism is whatever knowledge and truth you construct is equally valid and worthy of what somebody else. Jeremy constructs what knowledge and truth is in his mind. It's just as good and just as worthy as what Keith constructs. Even if they contradict each other, because that's what pluralism demands. Therefore, in a postmodern educational system, the pass, it is not the passing along of knowledge, but it is, it is the stimulation to construct our own knowledge base, or our own knowledge truth. I don't think I have to really go over this in too much more detail for you to begin to see the impact this has on our educational system. And more importantly, the impact it has on our children. I have not homeschooled, but I suspect if I were homeschooling, I would have to go through some of that material and try to weed out some of the modern and postmodern issues. So just because you're homeschooling, I don't know that you have completely avoided this. And there are some, I can list, in my personal opinion, some negatives to homeschooling, and I can list some positive to homeschooling. I don't really have a position on it because I don't have anyone I have to raise in that sense. But of course, I think we all want that biblical worldview of truth, which is a rather simple one, at least in theory. We've seen this week, and we've discussed several issues. It's not always simple in application, but... That's probably our passion pulling us as much as anything else. We believe the biblical worldview, truth is revealed from God. And that means it's an approach that, well, it asks the question, does a approach that refuses to call answers right and wrong deserve to be called education? That really is saying, is the postmodern approach to education, does that really deserve to be called education? Am I being educated if I'm not taught what is right and what is wrong or what is good or what is bad? Well, obviously you would expect that I would not think so. This is a rather lengthy reading, but I'm going to try to do it in a way... I, I tried to cut out this, and every time I cut something out, I hurt it. And so I decided not to cut it out. This is a, an article from August 2010 by a gentleman by the name of Robert Moeller. And it's entitled, And Then They Are All Mine. And it's a description or an analysis of what happens to young people when they go to college. But I think you could apply it maybe now even to high school. Many of you are teachers, educators, you, you know the system, you know what goes on in your areas far better than I. But let me read this, and I know when we read, sometimes it's hard to, hard to follow, but a lot, of our, a lot of the teachers, including myself, have been reading even when it sounded like it was us. It was us, but we had our notes rather uh, thoroughly put down. I quote, and then they are all mine. There is nothing quite like the start of a new academic year on a college or university campus. Streams of students and faculty return to the timeless patterns of academic life, summoned by the desire for learning and a commitment to teaching. Among the thousands of college students arriving on campuses at this time of, of the year, 
There are freshmen representing the most eager and excited new members of the academic community. The transition from high school to college is one of the most significant seasons of a young person's life, and the energy and youthfulness they add to the campus are immeasurable and invaluable. The faculty also returns to their calling, and most begin the new year with a sense of satisfaction and eagerness that can almost match that of the incoming freshmen. There's an exhilaration in the experience of teaching. One of the greatest privileges offered to a college or university professor is the stewardship of learning and teaching as well as having influence over the minds and worldviews of young people at one of their most formative periods in life. For most new, prof most new professors find the experience to be nearly intoxicating. And even the most seasoned professors find the experience of teaching both the deeply to be both deeply satisfying and personally challenging. The power of a professor in a classroom is immense. The most and most teachers are deeply committed to their disciplines and to their calling. The classroom and campus are where so many lives are shaped and where minds come alive. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I'm, before I continue reading, I want to say I salute all the Christian teachers that we have, and we need more of you. Unfortunately, the, you are far outnumbered. What could possibly go wrong? He says a great deal. Even as most professors see themselves as stewards of, teaching of the teaching profession and fellow learners with their students, others see their role in a very different way as agents of ideological indoctrination. All teaching involves ideology and intellectual commitments. There is no position of authentic objectivity. Every teacher, as well as every student, comes into the classroom with a certain intellectual commitment. Some professors set as their aim the indoctrination of students into their own worldview, and many of these worldviews are both noxious and deeply troubling. A professor who acts as an agent of indoctrination abuses the stewardship of teaching and the professional calling. But this abuse is more widespread and dangerous than many students and their parents understand. For Christian parents and students, this should be a matter of deep concern and active awareness. The secularization of most educational institutions is, is an accomplished fact. Indeed, many colleges and university campuses are deeply antagonistic to the Christian truth claims and the beliefs held by millions of students and families. Furthermore, the leftist spin of most faculty is well documented, especially in elite institutions and within liberal art facilities. On one campus, a significant number of faculty members are representatives of what is called the adversary culture. They see their role as political and ideological, and they define their teaching role in these terms. Their agenda is nothing less than to separate students from their Christian beliefs and their intellectual and moral commitments. Now that is absolutely true. I'm not done reading, but I, I've got to interject. I went to a large university. The university I went to at the time I went there had 35,000 students. That's why I know my social security number. Because when I took a test, I couldn't put my name on it because there were 40 John Lees. I had to put my social security number on it. And I still know it. And I will tell it to you privately, but not on YouTube. <laughs> Unless you want to make a contribution. <laughs> but I would see many students from especially smaller schools, and they were just as intelligent but it was like letting the, the horse out of the corral. And, and a lot of things happened. Let me go back to his, the article. A good many of these professors deny this agenda, but from time to time the mask is removed. Writing in University Diaries column at a site insidehighereducation.com, a professor of English revealed his agenda with amazing candor, responding to an argument about the power of intellectual elites. This professor dropped any effort to hide his agenda, and he said, and I quote this professor, we need to encourage everyone to be in college for as many years as they possibly can. <laughs> Sounds like a guy who wants a paycheck. <laughs> this professor wrote, in hope that somewhere along the line they might get some exposure to the world outside of their town and to moral ideas not exclusively derived from their parents' religion. If they don't get this in college, they're not going to get it anywhere else. 
This professor mints no words. The college experience, the argument goes, is the best and perhaps last opportunity for someone to break students' commitments to their moral convictions derived from their parents' religion. Similarly, writing in a Seattle newspaper, a teacher of English and kind of college advisor at Northwest University in Evanston, Illinois, revealed his ideological agenda in even more shocking terms. Bill Savage reacts to the fact that the so-called conservative red states are outbreeding the blue states. Do you understand what red states and blue states are? That's, we sometimes call them, well, let's just call them more conservative and, and more liberal. He's concerned that the conservative states are outbreeding the liberal states. And that's affecting liberal voting patterns. Identifying himself as a political liberal with no children of his own, he acknowledged that he and his fellow liberals have a lower fertility rate than conservatives. I don't understand that. Nevertheless, he insists that education, educated urban liberals need not despair. He expressed confidence that blue America's urban community can grow larger and more contiguous and more political power without having any offspring. How? Well, children in red states will seek higher education, and that education will very often happen in blue states, and blue states are islands in red states. For the foreseeable future, loyal ditto heads will continue to drop off their children at the dorms. After a teary-eyed hug, mom and dad will drive their SUV off toward the nearest gas station, leaving their beloved progeny behind. Then what? He proudly proclaims, then they are all mine. That's right. A significant number of professors are happy to have parents spend 18 years raising their children only to drop them off at the campus and head back home. And these professors are confident that four or so years of, college, of the college experience will amplify, will be ample time to separate the students from the beliefs, convictions, and moral commitments and faith of their parents. And they're absolutely right. It often is. Even after expressing these truly breathtaking agendas, these professors go on to claim that they do not seek to indoctrinate their students with their own beliefs and worldviews, but no one can believe them now. The college experience is, of necessity, a time for the development of critical thinking. It is a season of tremendous intellectual formulation that produces lasting effects. Students should learn the disciplines of critical thinking and analysis, and in this transitional period of life, they will determine whether they will hold to the beliefs and commitments of parents. But they should not be subjected to ideological indoctrination and in intellectual condescension that is found in too, far too many classrooms and in far too many campuses. If nothing else, this remarkable statement of professorial intention should awaken both students and parents to what passes for education within much of higher education. The open hostility and contempt toward Christianity and Christian convictions is horrifying. And then they are mine. It's hard to imagine any more alarming words. For a Christian parent. I am obviously not against education. I urge all of you young people, if that's your bent, to get as much education as you can, or maybe I should say as much as you can stand. But just be very, very aware that you are going into a minefield, and parents be very, very aware that you are sending them into a minefield. And that's why the home has to be so diligent in this. How many young people have you seen go to college in one mindset and either come back with a different mindset or never come back again? And it doesn't have to be in college. I feel very privileged to have been able to go to college, and many of you did, but some of the smartest people I know never did. I think it's somewhat overrated, becoming more necessary in our economic forum but it's somewhat overrated. I want to talk a little bit about sharing our faith or teaching our children. And this was one of the questions that, that came up that I, I said I would hold till today, and I have. How do we impart a biblical worldview when they spend so much time at school? Valid question. I would simply make a couple of comments, and then I'll make 
couple more comments. Number one, they spend a lot of time at school, but they still spend more time at home than they do at school. And you've got them for the first few years. One of the reasons Donna and I opted for public schooling, it's not the only reason, is I wanted an opportunity to, to formulate their thinking and prepare them for the world without isolating them from the world. But that is not the only way to do it. I'm not, I'm not judgmental or critical. I really am not. But that was our personal decision. Could it have backfired? Absolutely. I don't think it has, but I don't know what the future, I do not know what the future holds. But we do need to stay in touch with them. There is no guarantee that when they grow up, they'll believe what we want them to. There is no guarantee that they will make the choices we want them to. And there is no guarantee that they will do the things that we want them to. But we do have a tremendous responsibility to teach them in the ways of the Lord. Fear of children developing deviant worldviews, to use the terminology I've used in my class, is probably exactly why some have opted for homeschooling and it is exactly why I would understand that. Because you do have more control over them, at least in their formative years. But either way, training our children is an extremely important thing to, say, to do. I mentioned yesterday that having children is not essential for a Christian. Being married is not essential for a Christian. But if you opt for that, you take on a tremendous responsibility that God holds each one of us that have opted for that to carry out. Because the home is simply the place where life makes up its mind. I think it's safe to assume, assume and I, I put Daniel chapter 1 in here, I find that to be just an intriguing passage, especially verse 8 where it says, and Daniel purposed in his heart to, to do things right rather than follow the king. How did that young teenage boy have a heart developed like that? Well, I'm going to speculate a little bit, but I think he must have had good parents. Where else would he have learned it? Yes, he had a few peers around him, but the power of parents, the power of the local congregation in formulating worldviews, a biblical worldview in our young, in young minds is, let us never underestimate that. Let us not wring our hands and say we can't, because we can, or God wouldn't have asked us to do it. Maybe as Josiah found the word, as they found the word hidden and, and it was, they had that revival, maybe Daniel's parents were part of that spiritual revival and they passed it on to their son. I don't know. The timing would make me wonder if that's not possible. But I think it's a powerful thing to see a young man, we don't know exactly how old Daniel was, but most people put him in his early teen years, to be taken away from his homeland, from what we would call our support system, kind of like going to college or going to the military, and he says, I purposed in my heart. Brothers and sisters, that came from somewhere. And I think it probably came from godly parents. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and following. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon your, upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the post of your house. Notice in that very famous passage, the first few verses say, Parents, you understand the Lord your God is one God. You love the Lord your God. Hear these words and have them in your heart. And then he says, teach them to your children because we cannot teach what we don't know and we cannot teach what we don't believe. 
But there is a tremendous responsibility here on passing them along. I, we don't have thoughtlets in our house. I don't wear them and on my hat. But those principles have to be taught. It, when we're teaching our children, be they our, our blood or just in our congregation, we have to verbally teach them. We have to, what I call, incarnately teach them. We have to teach them by our actions and by what we are. I don't know who wrote this, but I know where I copied it down from. And many of you know Don Warren. He has been here a time or two, but his, his age is keeping him from being here too much. At the insistence of his daughter, he, he sat down and wrote a 50, it turned out to be about a 50-page little booklet on his life, just going back what he what he did as a kid and all. So I was over there one night having dinner, and, and Don asked me to read it. Well, I didn't have time to, to read it, but I skimmed it. It was very fascinating, interesting. I got to the last page, and his daughter had stuck this in there as a tribute to him. I saw you stand bravely for years, but I saw no trace of senseless tears. I saw you stand calmly through stress, but caught no glimpse of bitterness. I saw you stand prayerfully in grief, but saw no trace of unbelief. And though you spoke, spoke well of Jesus Christ, I taught your, taught your faith by watching your life. Many of you knew my dad. Not This is an overstatement, but some of you may have almost spent more time with him than I did. Because he was all, he was gone. He and I probably sat and talked scripture and church during our lifetimes together, maybe a total of 30 minutes, and that's probably being aggressive. We didn't, we didn't have those long under the tree discussions of what do you do when someone gets divorced. I'd like to have them now, but we didn't. But he taught me what Christianity was all about with his life. And many of you have had very similar circumstances. I tended to learn the intellectual part of it to the extent I have at meetings like this from people like Jim Basic or Richard Riggins, who I would set in awe. I wasn't wise enough to know if what they were telling me was right without going and checking it, but they sounded right. And that got my attention. They were right. My point is, we can't just verbally teach our young people. We have to also incarnately teach them with our lives. Sometimes I'll hear parents say, and this can happen. I don't know what happened. They were taught. I begin to ask myself, well, were they? And please don't take that as being judgmental. It's just a, a, a thing I have. We've got some real living examples of Titus chapter 2, don't we? I want to spend just a few minutes, and that's, that's what it will be, on the attack on the Word of God, because we are undergoing a tremendous attack on the Word of God. Raise your hand if you've ever heard those words. Raise your hand if you know where they came from. They came from a New English, a New England, pardon me, primer. That was one of the initial textbooks when the colonies were formed in America. In that same New England primer, was a page like this. A, wise man maketh the glad father. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord. C, come unto Christ. Do thee not the abominable things which I hate, says the Lord. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that is the way they were taught the alphabet.
a little different. I wasn't taught the alphabet there. My One of my dad's favorite books that he got a hold of was called McGuffey's Reader. Maybe some of you learned from McGuffey's Reader. I didn't. I was in the Tom and Mary and Flip and Spot agenda. I don't know what they do now. But it has to now be done in the home, doesn't it? And that's not bad. But it is certainly not going to be done in the textbook. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject them. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget your children. A nation that forgets the word of God, its destiny is formed. Jesus said, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Then he shall come to his own glory and in his fathers and in his fathers and in the holy angels. I believe there is a new agnosticism. It's sometimes called neo-agnosticism. Agnosticism simply is, is the concept. We don't know whether there's a God. I think maybe for the church or for those of us, those who are somewhat spiritual minded, there is even a greater danger that has been called by others, and I, I, I accept the term neo-agnosticism. Neo-agnosticism, pardon me, is, a, is an individual that says, I believe in God, but I can't know for sure that the Bible teaches what we need for salvation, worship, doctrine, and morals. And I suspect a majority of people that we run into are going to fall into this category. Yes, I believe in God, but I'm not sure the Bible is the inspired, unerring Word of God. Thomas Jefferson has reported that he snipped out 84 verses from the Bible that he didn't like. I've got some I wouldn't mind snipping out if that was could be pleasing to God. Because they're hard for me. They're hard for me to apply to myself. They're hard for me to apply to others. What we have in neo-agnosticism is what I would call religious pluralism. Yes, we believe in God, but all these other <laughs> syncretic beliefs can be blended together. And it violates the law of non-contradiction, which I talked about last week. The law of non-contradiction simply says two contrary views can't both be right. I'm not going to take the time to read this. I'll simply put it up here. There's a good article by Tim Jenkins in Focus magazine entitled Censoring the Bible. And he goes through and quotes some, even some uh, pastors, if I could use that word, from Kansas City. It caught my attention. I don't have time to read it, so I just lay it up there for you. But Satan is attacking the Word. And maybe I should have started with this last week. He is attacking the authority of the Word. How else can we have women leaders in the church? How else can we have homosexuals accepted into the church? How else can we have on and on and on and on? People must not believe the Bible is authority. Scholars or academians will say there are errors in it. Well, yes, every... No, let me back up. There are no errors in the Bible. Yes, there are some errors in translations, but I think we have adequate to get us to the plan of salvation. And we can compare various translations that probably get very, very close to even the actual. God is not going to leave us without His plan. God's will is not hidden. We're the ones that are lost, not God's will. What does God say about His Word? I think Psalms 19, 7, 8, and 9, and that may or may not ring a bell with you, but as I flash down these next six bullets, it will. God says His law is perfect, converting the soul. It's a testimony that is sure and wise to the simple. Before I move on, in the Hebrew, if I understand it correctly, the term simple is a little different than we use the term. In the Jewish culture, simple simply meant open-minded. It meant someone who would allow any thought to come into their head. We consider open-mindedness to be a virtue. They didn't necessarily consider it to be a virtue. And I'm not sure I consider it to be a complete virtue. Because we have a lot of thoughts coming into our head from all different directions that really don't deserve to be there. He called it the statutes that are right, that rejoice the heart. 
a commandment that's pure, that can enlighten the eyes. It's the fear of the Lord that's clean and that endures. It says its judgments are true and righteous altogether. Some of you probably memorized those three verses sometime in your childhood. If you haven't, they're worthy of your, at a minimum, reading. It's a law, it's a testimony, it's a statute, it's a commandments, it's the fear of God, and it's the judgments of God. But today, the Word of God is being revised. Godly fear, and I talked about this last week for just a little bit. Godly fear is being turned into awe and reverence. I believe godly fear includes awe and reverence, but I think it includes much more than that. Morality is being revised. It can't mean that. Well, it says it. And as I mentioned, we're air conditioning hell. But that's not going to work, is it? We are in the midst of spiritual warfare. And we need to take it very, very seriously. As Christians, we live in two spheres. We live in this world, but we're citizens of heaven, aren't we? In Augustine's City of God, he describes two cities. He calls them the City of Man and the City of God. The City of Man, in Augustine's description is the product of man's pride and rebellion against God. It holds man's dreams and earthly hopes and values. It's a city of this age. It's Satan's world system. It's temporal. It's fundamentally opposed to God's good creed. But he also talks about what he calls the city of God. With firm foundations whose author and builder is God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10. It's a city with God's values, God's plans, that endures forever. And Christ stands at its very center. Augustine did not mean that the world is destructive to all goodness and to all justice. The world, the culture we live in, is, is not anti-all good and anti-all justice. Man has built great civilizations with virtues derived from being created in the image of God. And we are created in the image of God. And Christians should and can be actually involved in man's world. Building it, maintaining it, working alongside though, even those who have rejected God. But we should have no illusions, brothers and sisters. The earth is no utopia and we will have continual opposition from the world as long as we stand for the truth. And if you and I are not being somewhat rejected and somewhat ridiculed, maybe there's a time for us to ask us why. I don't think we should look for rejection or ridicule. I just don't know how we can live the Christian life and not have it lest, unless we simply are fitting in. That's been touched on in various aspects and various other classes. It is to this opposing and oppressing world that we are to take the gospel and not get contaminated. Somebody asked me, it was a question, we talked about it privately, but I won't mention it. In the last century or so, what has the church accomplished in terms of improving our society? Well, I can point to maybe little things where people standing for the truth has slowed down the devolution of our society, but I don't believe we are going to turn our society around, but I don't believe God placed us here to clean up the pond. I think he placed us here to take fish out of that pond and take them to the true church. And we can do that individually. We need not get discouraged by the fact that we will probably not determine who the next president is or what the next vast deal of legislation is. The war of the world is not really a cultural or political war. It is a spiritual war. And Paul reminds us of that in Titus chapter 3. That we are to be good citizens of this world even though our citizenship is in heaven. 
Jude exhorts us. Pardon me, I went the wrong way. To earnestly contend for the faith. And that's one of the thoughts I want to leave you with as I'm coming down near the end. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, exhorts us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And he places that 58th verse of 1 Corinthians 15 right after he talks about the resurrection and how our bodies will be changed and death has no sting and grave has no victory. How's that going to happen? Paul says, Corinthians, Iowans, Missourians, even Californians, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I have one more quote and then just a couple of closing comments. I do not know who said this or I would tell you. Man will ultimately become what he surrounds himself with most in this life. You and I will become what we surround ourselves most most with in this life. You want to hit it? Because I'm not sure what's next. This essentially ends my sensations with you. And you have been graciously attentive. Far more gracious in your attention than my lessons deserve. And this is a crucial, deadly, serious issue that we have to face. Have we been totally serious through all of my ten sessions? No. I have allowed, and sometimes intentionally, some of the lightness of our humanity to enter in. Because I don't know any other way to remain sane in the world I live. But let us never lose sight of how crucial and critical Satan's attacks are. Let us earnestly contend for the faith. Let us remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And with that, I now fade, or fade, (laughs) into the background, and I will let other more competent teachers close out our meeting.